to brave it. Good yep. So good morning. Um, welcome here today for all those people watching at home in the in the gallery. Oh, Roll call sees all present. Is there any disclosures or pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Um, that leads us into our public meeting for planning applications. And I have to read this passage as part of our, the planning application. So part of today's council and committee meetings include statutory public meetings that relate to planning matters. All applications identified in the public meeting section of the agenda today will consist of a public meeting which will be followed by deliberations. Any decision that is made at the committee today on these matters need to be ratified by council on Monday, April 1st, not April Fools, 2019. Each public meeting is required to follow <clears throat> the requirements of the Planning Act. In doing so, all members of the public in attendance today will have the opportunity to address the committee, make their views known before a decision is made. The process that will be followed is, staff will provide an overview of the proposal and the recommendations and the committee may ask questions of staff. I will ask if the proponent wishes to address the committee. The committee may ask them questions. I will ask if there's anyone wishes to speak for or against <coughs> the matter. Anyone wishing to speak is to come up to the podium, sign in by printing their name and contact information, make their comments, and the committee may ask questions. Staff may ask for clarification and comments. The committee will deliberate on the matter. A decision by council to either approve or refuse a planning propose, proposal can be appealed by a tribunal known as the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal on the basis of consistency and or conformatory, conformity of the provincial policy and of the county official plan policy. In order to ensure your right to participate in any appeal <clears throat> process, you must either make oral submissions at the public meeting today or provide written comments to council before a final decision is made on the matter next Monday. Any person wishing to address council next Monday, either verbally or in writing, must do so by advising the municipal clerk by 12 noon, Wednesday, March 27, 2019. If you want to receive a written notice of council's decision on a planning matter, interested members of the public will need to make a written request to the municipal clerk to be notified of the decision. So our first planning application is PDD-10-219 zoning bylaw amendments to permit year-round residential use. And my understanding is Justin is going to give us an overview. So welcome, Justin. So good morning, committee, uh, staff, members of the public. Um, as the <coughs> chair pointed out, we have a zoning bylaw amendment to permit a year-round residential use for Pedro and Shostra. The subject lands are located at Concession 4, south of Dover Road, part lot 6, registered plan 18R7513, part 3, geographic township of Dunn, also known as 36 Horseshoe Bay Road. The property is about uh, 0.7 of an acre. It's generally surrounded by other uh, resort residential uses as well as vacant land. And it's within the resort <coughs> residential node of Block Point. Um, so the the property was con was conditionally severed by or was severed by committee of adjustment and approved on April 11th, 2017. At that time, we were also forced to recognize that the property only had a frontage of five meters, um, and they approved a minor variance for that def frontage deficiency as well. The proposal now is to rezone the land's seasonal residential uh, and add a special provision for year-round residential use. Um, as well, because 
when we go through planning out application, it dissolves all the previous minor variants and things like that. Again, we're going to provide relief for the five meters of frontage that was approved by committee in April 2017. Additionally, holding provision will be placed on the subject lands until we get satisfactory septic and <coughs> So the proposal is consistent with provincial policy, it conforms to county policy, and it doesn't offend the Town of Dunville Zoning Bylaw 1DU80. Uh, planning staff recommend approval of this application, and the other recommendations are up on the screen as follows. So Justin, you know, the potential red flags for not approving this, none of them are, are present because it is on a municipal road, it is a half acre in size, and, it's, and it has a septic system correct it doesn't have a septic system yet and that's so that's the reason for the holding is so that until we get satisfactory satisfactory septic systems we put a holding on it and so that all the holding will be in place until we get those septic plans but yes all the other details are accurate. yeah okay and they're, they're in the process of getting a septic system approved okay are there any questions for staff from council seeing none does the proponent wish to address the committee for any clarification or any comments? Seeing none. Is there anyone else present who wishes to speak for or against the matter? Seeing none, I'll just ask one more. T oh, Mayor Hewitt? No, no, I'll, I'll wait. Okay. So just to clarify, there's no one wants to speak for or against this? Okay. So, Mayor Hewitt, you had a question, yeah, maybe to, for staff? Through staff, just, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, information was circulated to the neighboring properties. No comments, there's nothing in the report. So, <clears> uh, <throat> particularly uh, lot 38 or number 38, there's, there's nothing was uh, <coughs> reported back in terms of their concerns or there were any concerns? Through the chair, not as far as I'm aware. It, it, it. If, if there's no nothing there, there's nothing there. I'm just asking because there's nothing there. Through the chair, um, okay. so uh, the author of the report is not present today. Uh, Justin is, is pinch hitting for him, but I had a conversation with him uh, last week, and uh, it's it's been uh, uh, very quiet in terms of any uh, uh, inquiries or, or comments from the neighbors. And absolutely, uh, lot number 38, they would have been circulated. Well, that's why I was asking. Councillor Corbett. I'll move for approval. Um, yeah, I'm with Mayor Hewitt. There's, if there's no uh, concerns of the neighboring properties, I think it's a good thing uh, year round. It's probably good for the other neighbors too. So can I have a seconder for the motion? Councillor Lawrence, all those in favor? That's carried. That brings us to page 19, our second planning application, PDD-11-219, General Zoning Bylaw Amendment for Cannabis Production Facilities, Haldeman County. And again, I'd like to welcome, I think there's a few in the gallery for this presentation. And Megan is gonna lead us through this presentation. So good morning, uh, members of council, staff, and the public. So this is a presentation regarding a uh, zoning bylaw amendment that's going to apply to all three bylaws in existence in Haldeman County uh, to address and regulate and control cannabis production facilities. Hey, hey, it's just a little louder. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> So before I get into the actual zoning provisions and the details of the uh, proposed bylaws for the specific use, I just want to go over a couple of items. Um, so looking at background information, um, roles in relation to the federal government and municipalities, and some other details before I get into the zone provisions. Um, so prior to recreational cannabis being um, legalized in October of last year, so recreational cannabis consumption and production, um, cannabis uh, production for medical purposes has, was legalized by the federal government in and around 2014. At that time, Haldeman County and many municipalities uh, throughout the province took the interpretation um, that these facilities were as of right agricultural uses, therefore permitted as of right within the agricultural zone. Uh, so that has been staff's um, uh, general interpretation for these uh, uses up until today and the draft provisions. 
Um, staff prepared an information report, which was heard by council at the December 11th of 2018 uh, council and committee meeting. Within this information report, uh, staff also presented uh, draft provisions for cannabis production facilities for council's consideration. And at that time, uh, staff were directed to finalize those uh, provisions for cannabis production facilities and to bring forward um, finalized versions of bylaws. And that is what today's presentation is about, to present the finalized version of those bylaws related to these specific uses. In relation to these uh, cannabis production facilities, um, the uses themselves are actually licensed and regulated by the federal government through Health Canada. These license process establish various uh, rigorous requirements related to security clearances and security plans, uh, record keeping, and they also establish um, good production practices that look at packaging, labeling, uh, testing, storage, uh, sanitation, quality control, and also air filtration, so specifically odor. Um, so anything related to um, odor control and odor requirements um, and odor complaints are addressed through um, the federal, uh, federal government. In terms of the municipality's role, our role is somewhat limited. Um, our role is essentially that we can establish zoning provisions to further um, guide and direct where these uses can be permitted and further requirements related to these uses. Um, but we do not necessarily have jurisdiction over anything related to odor control. And that has been an item of concern um, identified through staff, by council, by members of the public. And the fact that we do not have jurisdiction um, has been clarified and confirmed by the county solicitor. Uh, so I just wanted to verify that and put that out here today at the presentation. So these proposed, proposed zoning provisions, again, will amend all three bylaws in existence. It will establish a general provision um, within the existing bylaws, uh, if approved by council, very similar to how we uh, establish provisions for the value added uses. Um, this, these specific bylaws do not address and do not permit um, those alternative producers. So essentially, these provisions are only um, allowing um, Canada, cannabis producers that have an actual license from Health Canada. It's not supporting those that say, say someone's father owns a farm, um, their whole family wants to grow multiple crops on that farm. The, these zoning bylaws uh, being presented here today do not support that or permit that. Um, someone in, that's producing cannabis will have to have a license from Health Canada to be a producer. Um, planning staff have reviewed the general amendments in relation to provincial policy and are satisfied the amendments are consistent and in conformity with all levels of provincial policy and that the proposed amendments are consistent with and maintain the intent and purpose of the Holloman County official plan. So the next couple slides I'm going to go into kind of some categories and details about the provisions being presented here today. Uh, first and foremost, um, staff are proposing that cannabis production facilities be um, defined and defined in a way that it actually links these uses to requiring a license from Health Canada. Um, we've also included an air treatment control system um, definition, um, but this definition does not establish any speci like specifications for this type of system, because again, that's outside of our jurisdiction, but it does allow for clarity as to what we mean as, uh, so we'll get into a little bit more in, in detail in the, in further on in this presentation, and also allows um, building officials to require um, anyone applying for a permit to produce um, confirmation that they have odor control. Right now, that's not something that we are required or, um, to um, obtain from um, any applicants for permits. Mm -hmm. Staff is proposing that these uses be permitted in the agricultural zone and in industrial zones. There's also several setbacks that are being proposed um, to, to deal with land use compatibility and separation of uses. Um, so one of the provisions is that on the site that a cannabis production facility is proposed to be located, the site cannot um, contain a dwelling, dwelling house, or a dwelling unit. So it has to be completely separate from that sensitive land use. Um, if all the other setbacks are met and there's no sensitive land uses that are in this vicinity, then the uh, operation is required to meet a minimum 30 meter setback from all property lines. Staff have also proposed a sliding scale uh, for production facilities. And I have a, a chart here that I hope is somewhat visible to everyone. So ultimately staff is proposing that we introduce a sliding scale. Um, so it's essentially saying that based on the size of the facility, 
and whether or not it has air treatment control. There will be certain setbacks from sensitive land zones. So your residential zone, commercial zone, institutional or open space zone. A certain setback from sensitive land uses. So that'll be a dwelling, dwelling on a farm, schools, community centers, retirement homes. And then a certain setback um, from settlement area boundaries. So in a situation where a facility is 75,000 square meters or smaller and has air treatment control, setback is 150 meters. In a scenario where it's 75,000 square feet, um, but no more than 100,000 square feet and with air treatment control, the setback from sensitive zones and uses is 200 meters. Staff is also proposing if a facility is larger than 100,000 square feet and again has air treatment control, that the setback from any sensitive zone and use and settlement boundary is 250 meters. And then if any, for some reason, despite the size of the facility, if, if the air treatment control system cannot be confirmed or that is not presented to staff for whatever reason, it would obligate someone to maintain a 300 meter setback. So by putting um, the reference to the air treatment control system within the bylaw, the intent is almost to provide an incentive in a way to, to present this information to the county so that we can at least know for comfort that there will be a system in place to deal with odor specifically. And then we can even take a look at the specifications, although we can't necessarily comment or require them to do more than what the uh, federal government is requiring. And that um, if they don't present that information to us, they have to maintain a pretty hefty set setback from any sensitive zones or land uses. <clears throat> So carrying on with the zone provision details, um, there also are provisions that are related to site design. So we are requiring all facilities, regardless if they're in the agricultural zone or not, to be subject to site plan control. Currently, any agricultural structure or use in the agricultural zone is not subject to site plan control. So this is a, a new feature that's being included within the bylaws. There will be established parking requirements, uh, a minimum of one stall per 100 square meters of gross floor area. Um, these uses, so any aspect of this use will have to be located within an enclosed structure. So that includes the loading zones and that prohibits outdoor growing. So again, that would, in staff's opinion, help address any odor concerns um, in place or that are out there um, or experienced uh, by the community. Um, there is no on-site signage or advertising um, and that ultimately there will be a provision to allow that security booth be permitted in the front yard. Some other provisions also include, um, despite whatever zone the use is located in, a standard provision with most bylaws is that it must comply with uh, the zone provisions of the zone that it is within, um, that these facilities will be required to be located on a lot size of no less than 10 acres, and ultimately that there's no other uses that can be um, operating on site, no co-uses that can operate on site other than traditional agricultural crops being grown. So once these bylaw provisions come into force and effect, which um, if approved by um, council and committee today and ratified at the following council meeting, um, and depending on when we send our notice, would be in and around April 23rd. Um, once these uh, provisions come into force and effect, the provisions will apply to new construction. If anyone seeks to convert an existing um, greenhouse per se, um, or if someone that's in existence already um, wants to expand their operation. Ultimately, these uh, zone provisions cannot be retroactively applied to any existing operations that have, are in operation now, have, are under construction right now, or have received uh, a permit um, or are going through the permitting process right now. And this is ultimately because they're being approved under the current zoning bylaw, which ultimately allows these uses in the agricultural zone. Again, staff reached out to the county solicitor to confirm that there is no way to, um, to confirm that these zoning provisions would, the new zoning provisions would not apply to um, existing operations and that has been confirmed that they cannot be retroactively applied. So that means any existing operations um, at the time of these bylaws coming to enforce and effect, so in around April 23rd would be the potential enforce and effect date if approved. Um, would be considered legal non-conforming or grandfathered in. So they're allowed to exist where they are and as they are. However, if they ever wanted to expand, they would have to show that they would comply with the new zoning provisions once they come into force and effect. 
Also, if someone wants to go into an, an existing operation, it does not grandfather any existing, um, like existing greenhouses. They would have to, com any cannabis production facility that wants to move into and convert an existing greenhouse would have to again comply if they want to do the conversion after the zoning provisions have come into place. Um, staff also looked at um, just almost through like an aerial review, an aerial mapping of um, various um, greenhouse operations and, and specifically in the township of Moulton. And ultimately, I think it can be clearly stated, it would be a challenging in that specific uh, scenario in that area, in that geographic township, to convert any existing large um, greenhouse operations. Because um, for one reason or another, a lot of the properties that were investigated did not meet one or multiple of the zone provisions. So conversion would be very challenging. So it's very likely we're going to be seeing new builds um, in order for someone to comply with all of these zone provisions. Um, and with that said, um, as of March, um, so March 22nd, 2019, um, we have issued, Haldeman County has issued about nine permits for um, cannabis operations within Haldeman County. And based on a review of those operations, it's likely that none of those operations would be in conformity with the provisions being presented here today. So they would be considered legal nonconforming or grandfathered in um, once these bylaw provisions come into force and effect. And I believe there is a, a map of locations of those operations within your council folders. Um, so part of this research project and putting together and uh, finalizing these draft uh, zoning bylaw provisions, um, staff looked at multiple communities um, throughout Ontario, some that are close by, some that are just in the grand, uh, greater Toronto area, and just looked at what different approaches are being applied and see if there's something that could be applicable to the uh, Holman County context. And what was a st uh, st ultimately determined is that a lot of the provisions that are in place or being prepared by other municipalities uh, have a fairly consistent approach to them. Um, the zones traditionally seem to be in the um, be permitting these uses in the agricultural and industrial zones. Um, there was some slight variation in the setbacks, but it, it does seem that the primary, primary, the consistent approach is 150 meters from sensitive uses and zones. We did see in some municipalities, and I would say probably more urban areas where they did establish a 70 meter setback, um, even in um, agricultural zones um, for a production facility from uh, a sense of use or zone. And then um, several communities utilized a 300 meter setback um, from sensitive zones and uses if there was no confirmation of air treatment system. So in terms of the zones and setbacks, Haldeman County is taking a very similar approach that is already in force and effect or being um, put forward by other communities throughout the province. Um, there were a couple of communities, I would say specifically two communities, that had some form of a, a defined air treatment control system definition that had specifications and or an odor control bylaw. Um, however, planning staff is not presenting anything of that nature here today because ultimately we have had the legal um, interpretation and confirmation that it would be outside of the municipal jurisdiction to do so. Um, so in terms of public engagement related to uh, this, these specific amendments, um, staff uh, partook in a couple different ways to try and engage the public and inform them about today's meeting and what staff's putting forward in terms of regulating these specific uses. Uh, so there was a new, uh, newspaper ad. Uh, we've developed a web page with a rotating uh, web banner um, with information and also utilized our social media accounts, uh, Facebook and Twitter. There has been um, a variety of input that's been provided by the public, uh, primarily focused on uh, setback from residential uses um, with a concern that the 150 meters is not uh, far enough and not a, a large enough setback, um, odor concerns, and, and more recently, um, some had identified concerns of the <clears throat> fact that these provisions did not seem to address existing operations. Um, in terms of um, a follow-up or feedback to those, those comments, um, staff are of the opinion that through the sliding scale that we have introduced um, additional and heightened requirements for setbacks from sensitive uh, uses and zones and through the application of applying an air treatment system requirement that we think that we've um, satisfied this, this specific item. In terms of odor concerns, um, ultimately because it is out of our jurisdiction to require um, more than what the, the federal government requires or higher specifications um, regarding these types of systems, the municipal municipalities across 
all municipalities, including Holman County, have the opportunity to utilize other mechanisms, which is zoning, site plan control, separations and distances, um, and, and overall site design to help deal with and mitigate land use compatibility issues and, and odor at the end of the day. And again, with the existing operations, due to legal advice uh, received, ultimately anyone that is um, legally operating at the time of these bylaws come into force and effect are grandfathered in um, until they want to do something else and they wanted to expand um, would these provisions apply to them. Um, in terms of other stakeholder comments, um, no major objections are received. A variety of different divisions um, internally and externally were circulated on the proposed amendments. And I would note that planning staff did provide the staff report and the bylaws to the county solicitor for review. And ultimately, it was concluded that everything that we're, being, we're putting forward here today is appropriate and within the jurisdiction of the municipality's rights uh, and ability to put forward in that type of information. So in terms of next steps, um, de depending on uh, council's perspective, um, there's different approaches that can happen. So if council is satisfied with what staff is proposing here today, um, then what staff will do um, would, these bylaws then would go to council the following Monday for enactment, and then staff would uh, go forward with the standard notice requirements, uh, the 20-day appeal period, and declaring uh, the bylaws um, if there is no appeals received. Um, however, if council is not satisfied with the, the bylaw provisions as being presented here today, um, staff and say modifications are required or additional review is, is, is identified by council being required, then staff will uh, amend the bylaws as requested, um, look at other options if that is the direction of council, and then we will bring back the, the bylaws um, for another public meeting if, if that is what council is um, looking for here today. So with that said, planning staff is recommending approval of the subject application and recommending that council um, approve the bylaws and the general amendments to all three bylaws within the county. Thanks for the report, Megan. Um, a couple questions I have before we ask other councilors for questions. Um, worst case, we have a company who wants to do something here and they're concerned with the bylaws and they appeal it. Where does that leave us for timing and getting this bylaw enacted? Through the chair, that's a complicated question to ask, quite frankly, um, in the sense that uh, the appeal process has no specific timeline associated with it. So if it is appealed, um, there is a process through the local planning appeal tribunal where there is an opportunity for mitigation um, to, to take part, but there is no like set timeline as to when the appeal would be addressed, but there is a set timeline as to when the appeal can be submitted to uh, uh, to the local planning appeal tribunal. Yeah, so that, and that has to come in the 20 days? That's yeah. correct, yes. Okay. 20 days after the decision of council. Which would be next Monday, 20 days after that. That okay. is correct. That's why that April 23rd date you mentioned. Okay, I followed that. My other question, um, I think going back to one of your first slides, if, if there's nothing sensitive land and whatever, we have a 30 meter, we're suggesting a 30 meter setback? Through the chair, that is correct, yes. And so then that's other municipalities potentially have up to 70? Like, what, can you give me the rationale of why we chose 30 and not maybe a little more? Just a question. Uh, through the chair, um, so in other municipalities, they applied 70 when there was a sensitive land use. So the 70 meters was measured from a sensitive zone or a sensitive land use. Um, in our case, we're saying the minimum distance is 150 meters. Okay, so um, we're even larger than some that are currently set out. That is correct. Okay, that's good. Councillor Corbett? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I certainly agree with the recommendations, but I think the uh, difficulty we have, and a comment probably will be made, we're closing the gate after the horse is out. I think we have an obligation to protect those who have concerns within our municipality, and my question would be, uh, why has it taken so long? And what is an approved odor <clears throat> control system? Certainly if I travel up the hill on uh, Fawn Hill, I can detect <clears throat> that there's a system around there right away. If they're approved and abiding by that law, why am I smelling that type of thing? So why did it take so long to respond and how about odor control approved system? <clears throat> Through the chair. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, on the on the first question, um, uh, 
this is a, uh, <clears throat> a land use issue that is, is um, uh, become increasingly um, um, prevalent, if you will, in the communities over the course of the last um, half year or so. Uh, when uh, it started to, uh, to to gain some traction and, and, and concern was uh, was increasing within the community, uh, we were asked, um, uh, we were directed by council to uh, to uh, to get um, a, a series of uh, preliminary provisions uh, in front of this body. Uh, and uh, that was back in November, and uh, we brought those preliminary provisions forward in December. Um, and from uh, from that point on, we uh, we established uh, what we view as a fairly aggressive uh, timeline in terms of getting uh, all of the uh, the necessary research completed, um, legal review, uh, public notifications, et cetera, to get to the point we're at today. Uh, so. Um, I think when you when you look at the the, the time period um, from from the the point of the direction of council uh, to where we are today, uh, it has been uh, fairly abbreviated, if you will, uh, when you when you compare it to um, you know, to other uh, similar types of general amendments that um, that that have been brought forward in the past. Um, really, this is uh, I think at the end of the day, um, uh, us responding as quickly as possible to uh, to an emerging land issue. Uh, and uh, I don't know if that answers uh, uh, your, your question, uh, Councillor Corbett, um, but uh, that's how I would, uh, I guess, uh, more or less frame the response to that. Uh, if I may, I'm just wondering, other municipalities were able to make that commitment earlier, and you're saying we didn't have all the information to go ahead with it? Uh, through the chair, um, uh, there are a number of other municipalities who are, are, are where we are at right now. There are some that are behind us in terms of um, their research, and then there are certainly some that have had provisions in place for, uh, uh, for quite some time. Uh, some of those municipalities that have provisions in place or have had provisions in place for quite some time, um, uh, they were faced with, with this, this land issue sooner than we were, if you will. Uh, there are other communities that uh, have had a, uh, a prevalence of, of these types of facilities for, uh, for a number of years already. Um, one example would be Norfolk, where uh, I don't have a number to share, but uh, they have many, many facilities that have been in place for quite some time. Uh, so it, it was a, um, uh, an issue that they were dealing with uh, already two years ago uh, on the ground, uh, and it's really something that, um, as I was saying in my uh, previous comments, uh, is, is more recent on the ground uh, here within the county in terms of it, it, its growth, if you will. Now, if I may, the uh, restriction with regard to non-conforming use, they can go with what's existing, but any changes they make whatsoever has to come back through the uh, Committee of Adjustment where other people get an opportunity to take a look at it? Through the chair, that's absolutely correct. Uh, whether it would be the committee of adjustment or, or council, uh, we would determine that at the, at the point of, um, of of any application inquiry, uh, and that's really dictated by which, which stream it goes through committee of adjustment or, or, or council. It, it really depends on the, um, uh, the the complexity of of what the ask is, the the significance of. Um, of what a deficiency might be, uh, those types of things. But absolutely, um, it would uh, any um, uh, expansion or, or new operation uh, that would not comply or conform with uh, with the the new provisions would have to go through a public process to achieve uh, uh, permission. And the other question: What is an adequate odor control system? Through the chair. Um, the, the bylaw provisions we've, we've uh, crafted um, don't use the word adequate. Uh, rather, um, and I'm just going to bring it up on my screen here, bear with me. Um, and this is, this is the wording, and then I will I'll do my best to answer the, the counselor's question. So an air treatment control system uh, is a system designed, approved, and implemented in accordance with a license issued by Health Canada for the purposes of controlling emissions, including odor. Uh, it really is, and I don't want this to sound like passing the buck up the chain, but it really is Health Canada, that it, Health Canada uh, so at the federal level, uh, that is responsible for reviewing the, um, the type of system and the suitability of the system. Uh, what, what we're proposing, uh, as, as Megan was overviewing, um, is to um, ensure that, um, if you will, setbacks are tied to the provision of such a system, meaning that um, if a system is is uh, is incorporated, 
um, with a uh, with a development proposal, there is a, a lesser setback, and that's by virtue of odor being controlled at, at the point or at the source. Uh, whereas, if for some reason uh, there's there's no demonstration of that system being included, um, then that setback gets larger. Uh, so, what what we're, what we're proposing is is not to um, as staff determine the adequacy of a system or, or what is a good system versus not as good a system. Um, that really has to be left to um, to the regulator, which is Health Canada. Uh, and our understanding is they do have certain parameters or specifications that have to be met. Uh, really, our approach is is to um, make it very very clear that uh, a system should be included if you're going to um, have the benefit of a slightly lesser setback. So, if I may, a complaint about earlier control. Who would one go to? Is it local municipality, which will probably receive the complaint or federal uh... through through the chair uh, there there are two avenues there um, and we've we've had conversations with um, with various provincial ministries so um, it, the the initial go-to would be um, in our view and, and again with our, our consultation with our solicitor Health Canada because uh, that again is the regulator uh, in particular as it relates to odor control um, so uh, that would be one avenue um, another is um, uh, there is a, uh, and I hope I get the term right, um, normal farm practices board that exists uh, under the umbrella of the uh, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, OMAFRA. Uh, and they deal with um, complaints relating to um, uh, various farm practices, uh, you know, whether it's um, you know, livestock too close to a stream, potential pollution, <laughs> right on through to odor. Uh, so there is an avenue there as well, uh, and that has been communicated to us by, uh, by OMAFRA that um, that is a, a vehicle that could be used uh, if there is an offensive operation. Uh, they would do an investigation. There is a board that, that sits and deals with and can, uh, can levy an order for, for some degree of compliance, um, some changes to, uh, to operations or even some physical improvements. So Health Canada and OMAFRA would be the, uh, uh, the two parties that we would... Um, uh, facilitate a connection into. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I have uh, four of the councillors that have some questions. I'm going to start in the order that I was acknowledged. So, Councillor Metcalf? Um, my question has been answered. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Lawrence? Um, yeah, thanks, Megan and staff, for all your due diligence on this. It's uh, a lot here. Um, with regard to um, the no odor control system, uh, on the advice of our solicitor, if correct, clearly, we have no control over forcing that, if I understand that correctly, for a new system to come in. And, but we do have control over the parameters for setbacks if they do not install one. Is that correct? Through the chair, that is correct, yes. Good. Uh, Councillor Patterson? Yeah, thank you. Through the chair to staff, and it's kind of piggybacking on what Councillor Lawrence has stated. And I thought up until this point, everything that I read or understood that any odor concerns was handled by Health Canada. Now, when I read, I'm a little bit confused, and maybe you can just explain. When I read the report on page 12, under Ministry of Environment, the last bullet point, they're making reference to, they say, the county may want to consider additional requirements to control odors. Is that, have we done that already by, by offering the minimum setbacks, or is that above and beyond, or is that what they're referring to? All we, all re say, I'm not putting words in your mouth. All we could do additionally would be that sliding scale to change it or add to it. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor Patterson um, has, uh, has hit the nail on the head that what we have produced and what is before you today uh, is, a, uh, if you will, a response uh, or in line with what the ministry had uh, um, suggested to us. Thank you. Good. Councillor Domani. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, Megan, I, thanks for your presentation. I certainly um, support the recommendations in the report. I guess just a couple questions. One would be, um, of all the other municipalities that you scanned here that are in, uh, listed in the report, or any others that you're aware of, are we aware of any appeals that have been made in regards to bylaws, attempted bylaws that are being passed? Through the chair, um, I'm not specifically aware of any appeals. Um, I'm not certain if Mike or Craig are aware of any, but we're, we're not aware of any of okay. specific appeals. And, and when we talk in general about uh, these cannabis production facilities being allowed in the agricultural zone, you know, you made a comment in your, in your slide presentation that 
you know, the county views that the agricultural zone is, is conducive to, to the to growing of cannabis, but it's really the province of Ontario that's initially uh, telling the municipalities that we, we view the growing of cannabis in, in agricultural zones as a, as a normal practice, just like we would uh, whatever the case may be, soybeans, wheat production, whatever the case may be. I mean, they're endorsing that, correct? So the chair, um, OMAFRA is of the same opinion that these operations um, are agriculture in nature, hence why they um, can deal with odor issues and complaints through the normal farm practices. Okay, because it, um, it's not too board. often that we do something without the endorsement of the province. Land use in general, right, is what, I, is what I'm getting at. The other thing I would ask you is that can we, can we get some names and numbers, contact people that, that we can pass out to the public for Health Canada and, and OMAFRA? Because, you know, th those of us that are on Question. prior councils, we know that if, if there's a major emission from an industry here in Haldeman today, whether it be Stelco or Canadian Gypsum, whatever the case may be, the MOE's on it pretty quick and generally staff, we, we know who to get a hold of. If there's uh, an odor coming from a hog operation in in the county. Uh, I, I've had an occasion where I, where I've you know where I've had, got the number from staff. We've got a hold of the MOE rep. They've gone out and and done an, done an inspection and done a report. Manure spreading, biosolids. Those are all issues that we've dealt with, and we and we readily have contact names. I'd like to have something passed out to council so that. The calls are coming are already and we, and we can give them a name and number and easily get them that information so they can they yeah, can I'll go to you after talk to somebody thank you mayor Hewitt. uh so a couple questions one uh, of this map of uh that currently has the existing operations and permits being issued uh, potential do we know of are they all considered lps are these or are these a mix of LP operations and, and other operations? Through the chair, our understanding is they're all LPs. So, um, so licensed producers as opposed to those alternative producers that Megan was making reference to uh, in her report. So uh, uh, they would be um, producers that would fit the definition that we that put before. That are following the Health Canada's prescription. That's our understanding, yes. So do we have any information on what else is within the county that's not under the Health Canada LP rules? Through the chair, no we don't. Can we, is there any way of us being able to obtain that? I realize that, I mean, these people can simply plant a greenhouse and, and, and grow as per their, their medical license, but is there some way of us being able to determine how many of those types of could I guess where I'm leading is well I, I I appreciate the bylaw and the intent behind the bylaw but it's 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 the ones that are following the rules and 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 are building a site that's 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 more appropriate than the ones that aren't that are causing the concerns at least from my understanding across the province is that that's where the issues seem to arise is these ones that uh, that come together in the form of a co-op that are completely unmanaged, and so this bylaw, my understanding, doesn't really Deal tackle that. that particular group of individuals. Yeah, through the uh, through the chair to the initial um, uh, question of the mayor, uh, the short answer is is no. We we really have no method of um, tracking or, or 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 finding out where these. Um, <clears throat> What would be illegal operations uh, via the uh, the draft uh, the draft zoning provisions exist? There's there's no permitting involved. There's no uh, planning permissions involved. They're just they're setting up. Um, really, the only way um, those types of operations would would come onto our radars is likely by local intel. What I mean by that is is neighbors that um, you know put a complaint in that type of thing. So <clears throat> so with that, Mike, because and I. I I knew that was the answer, but I, I, I wanted to make it very clear because I think for the public and for those that are that are seeing these types of operations occur, it, in a lot of cases you can only manage what you can manage and certainly what you know. But I guess my, my question is, is there anything that we can do to equip ourselves to prohibit any of these medical licensed uh, operations prop up anywhere and, you know, whether 
is, is there anything in the act that allows us to stop those? Yeah, uh, through through the chair, um, I think the the short answer to that is you know what exists in the act is in terms of a tool is what we're dealing with today, and that is zoning, uh, and really. Um, that, that is the only planning tool that we have uh, under the Planning Act. Um, we've, we've worked to make it as, uh, as clear and as restrictive as possible, again, in working directly with our solicitor, um, you know, with, with, uh, as part of our aim being to, to try to um, um, uh, be as restrictive as possible uh, to, to, to weed, or lack of better terms, weed out, but to, um, uh, to, to, yeah, to, to weed out those types of, um, uh, those types of uh, alternative producers that you're describing. So really, I guess at the end of the day, uh, this, is, uh, this is as far as we believe um, uh, we, can, uh, we can push things, if you will. So, uh, so I think Councillor Del Monte brought it up from the provincial perspective. There needs to be something coming down from the province that, that enables us to manage this situation where you know, we realize everybody can grow if they have a license medically, they can grow personally for a certain amount. But if they, if they get a license for their whole family, now they can grow four or five times that amount so they can prop up a greenhouse in their backyard and, and, and there's no setbacks, there's no, there's no bylaws, there's, no, there's nothing to manage that scenario. And, and, and I think that's where we're at a crossroads and where a lot of the municipalities are struggling with is not managing what Health Canada has already put prescriptive rules in. It's it's these these you know wild wild west co-ops. I'm and, not and, looking for an answer on that, but I think that's just to to clearly definitive be definitive of what we're attacking versus what we know is still out there and existing, and and the challenge for us is trying to manage. Okay, so just to follow, and then there's a few other councillors have a couple of questions too. Mike, um, is this any different what Ken is suggesting about these kind of so what we're saying is that these other ones that are not licensed by the federal are they illegal and are they similar to the grow ops that popped up 20 years ago in real estate where they come in and buy a bungalow home and then grow 30 plants and then it, the police got involved or we don't have the ability for the police to get involved in these other operations that Mayor Hewitt is suggesting through, through, through Craig, you, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll try to help as best as I can. So there's different scenarios. Under the law as it stands right now, each household is allowed to have four plants for personal consumption. The issue the mayor has said is if I want to get together with my neighbor and <coughs> put it in a, a co-op, what I've tried to do through the bylaw is say that's not allowed. You can have the four in your house, you can have a licensed facility, subject to the rules that's not allowed if someone's going to not comply with that what Mike has said is it's very difficult for us to know if they're not doing that however if we do get complaints we do we as well as uh, the enforcement officers from the health and social services um, will in fact look and see if if it doesn't comply and we'll, we'll we will do the enforcement as best we can this is not a silver bullet. It's not going to stop all the issues. What it's trying to do is deal primarily with the, you know, the, the, big, the big operations and ensuring that, for the most part, they're located in a fashion where the chances of conflict are, are, are mitigated to the extent possible. I also want to make the point that, and if you look at um, page 25 of your agenda, um, someone raised the issue of agriculture. So when we try to set up a bylaw, we try to do it on the basis of ensuring that whatever standard we're using has some rationale behind it and some consistency with how we apply those standards. So you'll see in the middle of the page, you know, uh, we did so there's something called a, a minimum distance separation for livestock. And livestock are similarly an intensive agricultural use. It has odor. It has activity levels. It has those types of things, which is what happens in the rural area. And if you look at that, the setback is 231 meters from a, a sensitive use. So the 250 meters with odor control and the other types of things, it tends to align with that. 
The 300 meters without odor control is the same distance we would use or that is required from a separation from a sensitive use from a quarry where you've got vibration, explosions, dust, noise and things like that. So those separations are trying to <coughs> take into consideration the types of other activities that occur in, in that area. And so the sliding scale is really intended to try to mimic those, those other types of uses that could happen with just a permit under the current zoning. And so it's not a silver bullet. It's the best that staff have been able to come up with within the context of the legislation. Um, and it's also consistent with kind of where our wheelhouse is. We do not have the expertise to look at engineering on, on odor control systems, nor is it within our, 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 our scope of things. But what we have done is we've said, okay, if you're coming in for a permit, show me your license, show me the license has, has an odor control, and based on that, you have to be separated a certain distance. If you've got a license and you don't have odor control, doesn't matter what size you are, you've got to be 300 meters. And that's really the extent of what, what staff is trying to do. We're trying to deal with the mitigation by the distance, which is a very standard way in which land uses are dealt with and very consistent with all the other types of, of agriculture. uh, agricultural uses that are allowed out there. Good. And that's a good explanation. Uh, I have Councillor Metcalf and then Councillor Patterson. So. Or vice or, vice no, Councillor Patterson first. <laughs> <laughs> we do look alike. I want to just throw that out there. I guess confuse you a little bit here this morning because we're having so much fun. <laughs> Thank you, I think, to the chair. Um, just a small housekeeping item to staff, uh, if possible. I was in a local restaurant on Friday and was asked about one of these new locations on the map. Had I heard anything about it? I said, no. I said, well, don't they have to put signs up? Don't they have to inform the neighbors? I said, no, unfortunately, if it's agricultural land, they don't have to. So just as a courtesy, when we get applications or issuing permits, could staff let council know so we can kind of head off some questions with their local residents as far as what might be coming, if that's possible? Should be. We'll, we'll do our best, councillor. That's a good comment. Councillor Metcalf? Uh, I guess at the risk of maybe holding up the, the bylaw, but could we not maybe put a, a provision in there to make it more attractive for some of these? I notice a couple dots missing in my ward that are existing grow operations that I guess once Health Canada issues their, their license, they don't follow up as to, um, I guess, what type of facility or what type of... Uh, because it's just z a zoned agriculture, they just figure they're gonna grow it in the ground without any provisions. I know some of the ones, once they leave, the plastic all gets uh, busted up and blows all through the, uh, the neighboring uh, <clears throat> community. Is there any type of incentive to bring those into, uh, into the bylaw so we don't run into that problem? So you're saying there's a couple that you're aware of that isn't on the map? Yeah, well, they're, they, they've been in existence prior to the bylaw, and I'm assuming everybody knows that they, are, they have their medical, because at, at the time it was only the existing license you could get, but there weren't, we didn't have any bylaws as far as buildings or setbacks at the time, and I wonder if Health Canada even follows up with who they've issued licenses to, where, and are there any provisions under Health Canada that they need to follow you know, I think Mike Canada is in Ottawa, and we're down here in uh, in Haldeman. I think Mike or Craig is going to answer this through the chair. To to the best of our uh, our knowledge, um, Health Canada does have uh, uh, like an enforcement arm, uh, and also um, uh, the understanding we have is that uh, uh, they can do audits, much like you know the Ministry of Labor, for example, can uh, can do uh, uh, random audits or site inspections, that type of thing. So uh, that is, as we understand it, something they they can do and that they do do. Are there any other questions for staff from council? That leads me to, uh, there's no proponent, but is there anyone present in the gallery who would like to speak for or against this matter? And if so, you're welcome to come up to the podium. And thanks again, Megan, for that presentation. Seeing none, I'll, is there someone? Okay, great, come on up. Please sign in, and uh, you can adjust that mic if you like. Oh. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I live on um, Indiana Road East, 589. Um, rumor has it that there's a grow up going in right across the road from us. Uh, I don't see it on your map as, as having had a permit issued. I don't see it as a potential permit. I, um, I suspect most of the gallery here is from Indiana Road, and we're all pretty concerned about this. Um, yeah, it's agricultural, but there's a house here and a house here and a house across the road, which happens to be me. Um, it's a real concern for us. We've been out there 44 years, put everything we have into this house, and uh, our property value, I'm sure, is going to just plummet. Who's going to want to buy our house? You know, we're, we're seniors. We um, ultimately would be looking at selling. Then what? Um, <clears throat> and I agree. You know, we've, we're behind the times here. Um, this isn't new. Other, other areas have addressed it sooner than this. Yet we seem to be issuing permits before we've made any decisions about what we should be doing. Um, it's, a, it's a real concern for all of us. Um, we don't know what's going on across the road from me. Um, I hear it's going to be a grow up, it's going to be, it's going to be indoor, it's blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but there's no, there's no information coming for, for any of us. And, I, and that's a concern. Sure. Now, I guess my, <clears throat> and maybe staff can comment too, but if it's not in the queue right now as far as an application, maybe Mike can clarify. Um, if, if it isn't in there, then this bylaw will help it, but maybe Mike can ex clarify that. Through the chair um, uh, to, uh, uh, to the, the concerned uh, um, member of the public's question, uh, if it's not on the map, uh, then there is nothing in queue. Uh, the map that is uh, is at the uh, the podium is current to uh, to Monday of this week, um, uh, so yesterday. Uh, so um, again, it, it is capturing or reflecting uh, those operations where permits uh, have been issued, uh, and also those where where permits are are, are in process. So uh, I believe um, uh, I believe the comment was I don't see it on the map. Uh, uh, so if it's not on the map then as of yesterday, there's, there's nothing that we have in our hands uh, in terms of an application. Okay. Yes, we received emails that said that the permits had been granted for this property. Um, uh, from Megan, actually. Mm -hmm. if, could, could you just state your name for the Diane, minutes? Diane Jameson. Diane Jameson? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, there's an email from Megan. I think Megan. she signed it when she came. Okay. Um, I have a copy so, of the email here Mike, if anybody yes. wants it. So, so through the chair, uh, in looking at the map, <clears> I believe um, mention was made that um, Ms. Jamison was from uh, Indiana, Indiana Road. East. There is um, an indication on the map of a permit issued for 1201 That's Indiana Road East. That's the other side of 56. Okay. So that is, um, that is the one that, that we're aware of. Uh, and that there is a uh, a record of or a uh, a permit application for. Okay. So that would be 1201 Indiana Road yeah. East. So this, sorry, just for clarification, um, Ms. Jameson, this email you received is is from the Tim Hortons gallery or is it from the proponent that it's going in? Megan Ferris. Oh, so it is that it's going in? Yeah, sure. No, but well, then, so, in, so, this so it's not going in in the air address that through the chair. Mike, the letter from Megan, the references that the residents are referencing, is referencing the 1201 site you're talking about? Uh, a different th site? Th through the chair, I I'd, have to, I'd have to see the, uh, the letter or the email. Uh, what I was referring to is, is the map that Ms. Jamison was referring to. So this is the it's one concern, yeah. Concern. It's a big concern. <laughs> I have no idea. So, again, through the chair, this letter I'm, I'm looking at here, I'm not seeing an address. Uh, it's just referring to a property in Indiana Road East. Um, so, uh, again, back to, um, back to the, uh, the map itself. Uh, what it is identifying is, is based on the records we have, 1201 Indiana Road East. Um, that's the information that I have in front of me, um, which comes from uh, directly from the building division, 
uh, which is the uh, the division through which a, a, a building permit application would be filed. And as as of like I said, as of yesterday, that's the only one that you have in the queue on Indiana Road East. Uh, to the chair, um, that's the only one that that we're showing at this point in time okay. on Indiana All Road right. East. So through, through the chair. Megan, and this is the is this the property that your letter is referring to, or do you believe it's referring to? If I might, no, no. you can't yet. You're not there. You can come up. Ladies, sorry, yeah, we'll get there. You can come up eventually. I received a, a request to know if there is a grow operation on Indiana Road. Uh, no actual site or address was given to me. I consulted with the building officials. They confirmed that it was 1201 Indiana Road that they had a permit for. So I confirmed that, but I did not confirm the location of the site because I did not know it was appropriate at that time to confirm the site location. But I was not asked a specific address. I just uh, responded in a general way, saying there is a permit being issued on Indiana, Indiana Road East. And that's, that's, what your, that's what your email said. Okay, that's just good for clarification here. Sorry, just to clarify, my email doesn't specify an address. It doesn't say Indiana Road. Through the chair, no. Okay. Because I was not certain that it was um, something I could share with the public at that moment in time because it wasn't issued yet, it was being reviewed. Okay. But now that it's being reviewed, we will, it's, it is the one that is on this address that we have. <laughs> Through the chair, that is correct. That is the uh, location that the billing official identified for me that there is a permit being reviewed at the time of this email um, on Indiana Road East. Right. Okay, good. Okay, and that being 1201. So that may or may that should help. C correct. Yeah, okay. So, okay, well, all right. Having said that, um, it shows on the map that 1201 is has been granted their permit not that it's it, being correct it's in the correct. it's in the queue that's why it's on the map but it shows that the, the permit is issued it's it so, yes so it's, it's not in the queue it's done let's Michael. okay yeah. so so through the chair um yeah when 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 the comment is made in the queue uh, i think what's being referred to is those issued um those that are under review uh but to to break out um the two categories, this particular one, it's a permit that has been issued for 1201 Indiana Road East. Okay. Um, um, and I, I see the setbacks and um, they are what they are. I guess the other concern we have is um, things like fencing, security, all of those things. Are they ever addressed through bylaws? They should, should they not be or are they or what's the story? Uh, through the chair, um, as the as Health Canada is the uh, the regulator, um, and I think Megan touched a little bit on this in her presentation, um, things relating to security, security plans, physical security, those types of things, uh, that's all part and parcel of the license that gets issued by Health Canada. So there has to be a uh, a site plan and a, a security plan um, that is uh, is provided to Health Canada as part of that application process, and then also ultimately it has to be implemented. It includes everything from fencing to cameras um, to uh, uh, to documented procedures. Uh, further to that, um, uh, as staff, we're recommending that the sites be placed under site plan control, uh, which is, is uh, another tool that gives us the opportunity to, um, to work towards mitigation of any potential issues. So uh, I think some of the examples that we laid out in the report is, is you know, where, where it could be warranted. We could look at things like um, uh, planting, uh, planting of trees for, for a visual buffer, uh, potentially uh, fencing if, if for whatever reason um, uh, a fence is not required for a particular location as part of the Health Canada license, uh, potentially things like berms, uh, whatever the case might be. Um, but the site plan process, uh, it's another application process uh, that, that is run through the county uh, and it is a, um, a vehicle that, uh, that's utilized to ensure that things are, are, are laid out, oriented, uh, developed appropriately on a site. It includes everything, like I said, from uh, from potential buffering um, right on through to the the layout of buildings, the the positioning of um, of, of venting systems. Uh, you know, for example, away from homes, um, stormwater management, lock rating, uh, lighting plans. I think that's an issue that has come up uh, as part of the as part of the mandatory site plan process. Uh, we would require what's called a photometrics plan, which is a, a lighting design, which actually will have to demonstrate um, how light is, is, is transferring, if you will, from the source out. Uh, and our standard is that there be zero light spillage at a property line. So that's another um, a mechanism to, to mitigate some of the concerns that we've been hearing from the public. Okay. All right. That's great. Thank you. Yep. And thanks for your comments, sir. Is there anyone else present 
who would like to come and speak for or against this matter? Yes, just come on in, sign in, and maybe just mention who you are so we can, for the minutes, please. <clears throat> Morning. Morning. Just uh, speak, is, yeah, speak into the mic just so there's, or move it over a bit. That'd be great. Yeah. My name is Mike Paquette. Uh, I live at 558 Indiana Road, <clears throat> right across the street from Diane Jameson. Um, so I just wanted to make a few comments to support what she's saying from our perspective as residents living on the road. <clears throat> um, we all kind of feel like we've, oh, I shouldn't say we. I, I feel like we've been kind of blindsided with the lack of information surrounding the development. <clears throat> and what I <clears throat> hope to do here today was get further information on the site plan control, because really without that, we don't really know what questions are appropriate to even ask. Uh, my concern, in addition to the odor control, is also light control. Now, I just heard this gentleman uh, say that's a federal jurisdiction. Um, so I'm curious as to what the process um, is that we should be following to get those concerns addressed. Um, do we deal with the federal? Do we deal with municipal? Um, <clears throat> so far, the information we're getting is, is kind of after the fact, or at least it seems that way. So I'm trying to keep ahead of the curve in terms of understanding what I'm up against as being the adjacent property to this development, um, what that means to me in terms of how it will affect our uh, <clears throat> leisure on our property. Um, I can't tell you how it, you know, when we moved to the country from the big city, we did so for a reason, and surely you can all appreciate uh, sitting on your deck out in looking over the Cayuga skylight. It, it's gorgeous at night with the stars. Uh, we're afraid that's going to disappear. Um, if you look at the Pelham situation with the light control issues they had there, um, the skies were lit up like the northern lights every single day, 24-7. So we don't even know if this is an outdoor grow, an indoor grow. Um, if lighting is under control, if orders are under control, we don't know anything. So we're scared as hell, and we're yeah. frustrated. Well, Mike, just a question. Have you confirmed there is a grow up going across the road? Yes. We have, we have an email, contrary to what the person before me just said, we have an email that specifically states our address and that permits have been issued. Right? And, and it's coming from the county, you're saying? Coming from here, from a person by the name of Megan. So that's, what, okay. that's why we came today, was to get more information as to the site plan controls. Not in, in principle, we understand this. It's an agricultural crop. It's legal. We have to accept that. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that anybody can just come in willy-nilly and destroy our quality of life either, right? And, and surely you, you acknowledge that, and that's why we're all here. Definitely. But <clears throat> light control is as big an issue as odor. And anybody in the Pelham region will tell you that. I mean, we're all used to the smells of agricultural farms. I don't find, personally, I don't find cannabis any more offensive than manure. Um, but the lighting drastically changes my view sitting on my deck late in the evening, you know, with friends and, and relatives. And we can't even see the stars anymore. Well, that's exactly why we moved out of the city, all right? Sure. And we've only, we only bought this place a few years ago for where it was and what it was in the neighborhood and the community. All that is about to change, and, it, and it's happening way too fast. There hasn't been enough consultations. I sat through like four hours of consultations with the Pelham community, and I saw what they went through, and I see the exact same thing happening here, and, it, and I'm telling you, it's a, it's a nightmare waiting to happen if we don't get ahead of this. So th that's my two cents. Um, <clears throat> I still am more confused now than I was before I even came here with regards to whether there is or isn't something going in next door to me, and <clears throat> are they permitted, are they not permitted? Is it municipal, is it federal? Um, well, I think I it would know. all help and clarify a lot if you can show that email that has that address on it. If someone has that here, that would be great yeah. because Megan has disputed that it no, wasn't that. her that sent it out. So. Yeah. Okay, but, uh, uh, sorry, 
what can staff can do is uh, can meet offline I think uh, and uh, and maybe clarify that that might be have a, have a, a more discussion. discussion around this particular one right. yeah and, and that may help clear it up happy to sit down with you. Okay. okay that's good Mayor Hewitt but, uh, and I guess while you guys can, can do that offline and confirm it but this is kind of goes back to my questions and concerns and, and clarification to the public is that we're putting a bylaw in place to manage those that are following the rules. It's those that might not be following the rules that we're still trying to, to ascertain. And that's the challenge. And, and, the, and where I find or where I'm hearing a lot of the issues that are arising in other municipalities are those that are, that are operating independent of, of the Municipal uh, Act and their, or independent of Health Canada. And so I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to try to work together to ensure that that what's happening here is happening in with the site plan controls, following along with the lighting that you've raised, following along with the, 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 the smells that we can, the odor that we can manage, the setbacks that we've proposed. I think it's great, but we do gotta get some clarity on those particular locations where if they aren't following the LP or under the LP that we have the ability to to ensure that uh, you know, our, our, our neighbors are, are well looked after because we, we share the same issues we certainly want that for you and so with respect to the site the site control plan what are the next steps like what do we do as residents to follow the, the developments and um, like because I mean is it federal is it municipal like are we kind of just sitting with our hands crossed waiting for so I don't, I don't really know the extent of what we're dealing with. I don't know if I should be putting a for sale sign on the house or saying, you know, just, just, you know, comply with the government bylaws and the municipal bylaws and everything will work out. I don't know. I see what happened in Pelham and it, and it scares the hell out of me. Now, I, I understand they've come to some sort of resolution with regards to both lighting and odor. Um, but there are multiple LPs on that road and it only takes one to make it a miserable experience for anybody who lives there right now. Oh, sure. So, so I, yeah. if I may, I, and Mike, you can confirm, or Craig, but having that site plan control and that permitting process allows us to follow the same process we would follow, which is notifying the, the public, notifying um, those in the area of what's being proposed. And, and, and again, it's those are the ones that are following those rules. Right. So that, I think the crux of this is that making sure that those that are, aren't following the rules that we have some ability to be able to, to manage that. Okay. Good, good comments, Mike. Thanks for coming up. Is there, Councillor well, Damani? I just a comment of clarification here uh, because Mr. Paquette uh, and the other neighbors here brought up. In the follow-up that you're gonna do offline, can you please get a hold of Randy Charlton because one of the neighbors, I don't know if they're in attendance today, called me and they claimed that they were approached by the individual who claims he bought the property and the address is somewhere in the vicinity of the addresses that were just quoted here. Not on this map, because I noticed that first thing this morning, but I thought there was something also that also came out from uh, Randy Charlton a while ago. So he's probably, he may be aware of it, maybe, you know, maybe they're in discussions, I don't know, but if we can just get that clarification, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Very good. So any uh, applications that are under your um, review now, and I'm, I'm going to assume that 590 Indiana Road East is one of those. I don't know. Nobody knows yet. Um, are they on hold until this bylaw is passed, or can they get approval? sort of snuck in before the bylaw takes effect. I have my thoughts, but I'm gonna let staff uh, comment. Through the chair, um, the information that we have available to us suggests, again, that for, for 1201 Indiana Road East, and then all those other um, locations that are identified on that map, um, where, where either there's a permit issued or a permit in process, they fall under current zoning provisions. Um, so what's in your package today are proposed. The proposed provisions cannot retroactively be applied to those operations either under construction or going through the permit process that are shown in that map. Uh, they cannot be retroactively applied to those. Um, the, the law is very clear on that. Uh, and we've, again, um, 
just to satisfy ourselves, confirm that with our solicitor as well. Yeah, but just to confirm that, I think, so if anything happens between now and April 23rd, providing there's no, um, basically, uh, appeal period, that one of these or two of these could get in before the 23rd, correct? To the chair. That's what that's the question correct. is. Yeah, just to be clear. So, yeah, the 23rd is, All right, that's yeah. the answer. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to speak for or against? Please come up and sign in and state your name. My name is Susan Milligan. I'm from Moulton Station, Dunville area, and I would like to say to Council, I'm glad that you're making this move and addressing this situation. And I would like to back up this gentleman that was just up before me, that he is right. What has happened over in Pelham, Fenwick area is terrible. I have family and I have friends that live in that area and I have grandchildren that go to the school and it is just horrific, the smell that goes on in that community. And I think that we have to put a stop on any future grow-ups of getting away with the smell. And also, where I live, I can see the lights from that grow-up on Highway 20 in Font Hill. And that's quite a few kilometers away. But they light up the sky far brighter than Rosa Floral. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank, thanks for your comments, Susan. Okay. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak for or against this matter? Seeing none. Can I just make a comment? Yes. I just wanted to bring council's attention to uh, sorry, a letter in your uh, red folders from uh, residents Shelley and Dave Levine concerning this application. And there is a motion to accept that as part of the minutes. Thank you, Jen. <clears throat> is there any other further clarification from staff? Councillor Corbett? I'm looking at the letter that was tabled and it says with regard to item number three, two week, what is staff's response to to this indication that our by proposed bylaw is too weak? Is there something else we can do to en enforce it more? Uh, through the chair, um, I think the short response to that is, is, is no. Um, we've uh, incorporated as, as, as much as we believe we, we legally can do. And again, um, having run everything through legal counsel, um, legal counsel concurs that uh, you know, the, the, the bylaw is, is appropriate, is suitable, uh, and really goes as, as far as we can go. Um, uh, I think I would also comment in terms of the, the, the setbacks. Uh, I don't recall if this came out in the presentation, but the setbacks that we're proposing are at the, uh, at the high end. Uh, so when you do a, um, uh, or as we've done a municipal scan, uh, looked at what other municipalities are doing, and I think as Megan noted, some municipalities are low, as low <coughs> as 70 meters from facility to a sensitive use. Um, the, the lowest setback that we're proposing is 150 meters. Uh, and then again, with a sliding scale, the larger the facility, the larger the setback. Uh, and then all the other things that we had discussed as it relates to um, uh, inclusion of an air, air, uh, air control system. So um, I, I think the point there is we're, um, we're on the high end of, um, of the setback spectrum, meaning um, the the largest setbacks of, uh, of, of those municipalities that, uh, that we looked at. Uh, so I, I think it's as strong as it can be. Thank you. Any other clarification? Seeing none, can I have a mover for the recommendation on page 19? Councillor Corbett and a seconder, Councillor Metcalf. Just for the viewing audience, I'm gonna read out this recommendation of this bylaw. That the report PDD-11219 general zoning bylaw amendment 
for cannabis production facilities, Haldeman County be received, and that the application PLZHA 219021, a proposal to introduce a general amendment to the Town of Dunville Zoning Bylaw 1 DU 80, Town of Haldeman Zoning Bylaw 1 H 86, and the City of Nanticoke Zoning Bylaw NE 1 2000 Bylaws as amended to establish a definition and provisions for cannabis production facilities be approved for reasons outlined within the report PDD 11 219, and that the bylaws attached to report PDD 11 219 be presented for enactment, and that the proposal proposed general amendments are considered to be consistent with the provincial policy statement 2014 and the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. All those in favor? <coughs> That's carried unanimously. And this here is to receive the correspondence, so I need a mover um, to receive this correspondence. Councillor Metcalf and a seconder, Councillor Lawrence. Okay. So that the correspondence from Shelley and David Labine dated March 22nd, 219, REPDD-11-219, General Zoning Bylaw Amendment for cannabis production facilities be received as information. All those in favor? That's carried unanimous. That concludes our... So wait, just, just one second before you leave. Good. Um, so, uh, through to, to the chair, just, and I, I know I'm doing this on the, on, the, on the fly, but the email that I was forwarded um, you know, speaks to it being on Indiana Road, but it does not identify an address number, as Megan had said earlier. I just talked to the, ch the chief building official, Randy Charlton. The only one that they have on file is 1201. There is no other one in our queue received, talked about, in any other address, but the one that's at 1201 that's on your map. Good. Okay, and so that's where it stands right now, just so that you're, you're aware. So at this point in time, it's the one at 1201, and there is no other one that they have any information or talk to anybody or have at, at this point in time as of right now. Okay? Just to, but it doesn't help. You know, I'm sure there's people who are affected by 1201 Indiana Road, so it's not perfect news, but I'm just saying that's where it is right now for, the, for, for, for the, where we're at right now. Okay. So that concludes uh, this part of our for planning applications, the public meeting. And I'm going to turn the chair over. We're going to take a, wait, a two minute recess to clear the gallery. And I'm going to turn the chair over to Mayor Hewitt.
Back to an interesting morning. Not sure I can keep this seat as hot as you could, Councilor Shirt, but uh, I'll try my best. Oh, I'm best. sure you can. Yeah. Uh, so, Craig, page 62, is that correct? Community yep. Development Services, you're presenting the annual report. Um, through you, Your Worship, to Council, uh, uh, annually uh, we report to Council on the range of activities and things that are going on that uh, the department looks after. And as part of that, we give you a sense of both volumes as well as some performance measures as well as some trends. And this is really an attempt to try to give council a better sense of the things that uh, uh, the department's <coughs> doing that you may see incrementally, but you don't necessarily see the accumulation of them. So our department, uh, the Community and Development Services, touches on all three of the corporate pillars. I won't go through it to any great detail, but several divisions deal with development and, and development-related services. Several of them also deal with uh, community vibrancy and health. And uh, we also put a strong emphasis on partnerships to promote a positive image of the county with its uh, partners, both in terms of organized as well as citizens. Uh, the department has five uh, divisions. Uh, you can see on the, uh, the chart, which probably you, you can't read, at least I can't read them, uh, but it gives you a sense of the range of functions that the department deals with, as well as the number of people that are associated with the, um, with the department. So I'm going to go through the departmental activities and just to give you a sense of uh, things and, and trends. So uh, building permit statistics. Last year we had just under $100 million versus permits. Uh, the historic average is about 60 to 70 million. So it was up from uh, the, the average. Uh, it was down quite a bit from the previous year, which was a record year, but still significantly higher than what we've seen in the past, both in terms of construction value and in terms of the numbers of uh, dwellings that we have been built. So you can see from uh, the trends over the last five years, uh, you can see that it's been up and it's been down. 2016, 17 were record years. Uh, 2018 kind of leveled off a bit. But if you look at the uh, permit construction value, for example, we had 46 million in uh, 2013 and just under 100 million uh, last year. Uh, if you look at, uh, this is a slide that uh, we typically report on uh, how, uh, how often we meet our service standards. Um, we had some challenges this year. We, we uh, uh, took on some new software, so we haven't been able to produce that information for this year. Um, so I just talked about construction. So construction's higher than what we've seen, but less than the last couple of years. Uh, development planning activity is the stuff that's in the pipeline. This is the applications that are working their way through the process, and it gives you an indication of the, sort of the level of interest in terms of development that, that is likely to happen two or three, maybe four years out. <clears throat> So you can see that um, the planning group has been dealing with a lot of development uh, uh, inquiries, more than uh, approximately double than what we've historically done. Uh, the number of applications was up, as were the engineering documents. And the engineering typically happens when construction is imminent. But you can get a sense from the, the charts, the general trends in terms of uh, planning activity. Um, this chart gives you a sense of sort of what happened in total last year. So the first, I don't know how it worked this, but the first line indicates that we started the year with roughly 3,400 units that were in plans that had been approved. About 244 of those were built over the course, and uh, we added another 987 into the, the approvals, and that's mostly the two subdivisions in the south of Caledonia. And so that the amount of development that is uh, been conditionally approved is, is over 4,000 um, units. Uh, last year as well, we had a number of employment institutional uh, uh, applications, including uh, construction of uh, uh, um, uh, a tire warehousing business here in, in uh, Cayuga. And we've given you an estimate the number of employees that the employment generated. This just gives you a sense of the trends. So you can look at the numbers. You can see that the number of applications is generally trended up. 
You can see the activity levels in terms of staff meeting with people, a number of inquiries. Uh, and you can see in this particular case that uh, we have a, a reasonably good um, compliance to our adopted uh, standards. So for the new councillors, we have standards that say for a zone application, it should be reviewed in this period of time. In a site plan, it should be in a different period of time. And what we do is we track how often we actually meet those standards. So 85% of the time we're meeting those standards and 90% we're, we're hitting our engineering standards. There's a number of other things council has seen uh, that the planning group is looking after. We're beginning the official plan. You can see there's some background work that's been done. Uh, the comprehensive zoning, which is near and dear to Councilor Shurton's heart, is 80% is complete, as well as some work with the uh, conservation authorities on trying to uh, understand the impact of climate change, particularly along the lake shore <coughs> and uh, as it relates to our infrastructure in that area. Bylaw enforcement, uh, another group, you can see the trends. Uh, the bylaw enforcement over the last few years has trended up, uh, as has the issuance of parking tickets. A couple years ago, council gave us a staff person for the summer, and that person's typically been um, put on parking activity. Um, and so you can see that uh, those, those, those stats are reported in the uh, quarterly report, but it gives you a sense of overall where uh, staff are dealing with more uh, inquiries and complaints. Well, last year, we, well, 2017 was a, a real anomaly. We had over 3,000 of those. Last year was a little more uh, consistent with what we've typically dealt with. And in this case, too, under the efficiency measures, you can see that uh, we have standards in terms of how we deal with bylaw complaints. So the standard is uh, if you complain, you should get it acknowledged within 24 hours and within three days somebody's going to go out and cite and make sure that uh, they've investigated it. I think one key thing that's really important, and I think it's, 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 it's something I try to repeat, is that uh, the division is able to achieve compliance 98% of the time without having a ticket, without having to go to court. And so those ones that you, you hear about are really on the outliers. Uh, economic development and tourism in 2017, there were a couple strategies adopted by council. Staff has been implementing those strategies. A couple things you'll see this year is the, the branding piece, as well as council uh, put some money in the budget for next year to begin looking at the industrial land supply piece. Uh, as well, we uh, established late last year a business development advisor committee, and then that committee is going to begin meeting uh, shortly to, to help council uh, in this particular area. One of the key focuses last year was trying to put some emphasis on uh, tourism, uh, growing our tourism industry, uh, trying to uh, get the word out there, and so that there was a lot of work uh, done to work with um, people coming in who would subsequently blog about it, as well as making sure that we're working with our stakeholders to coordinate activities towards creating that tourism experience. Uh, in addition to that, there's some infrastructure. We put some signage to help people find out, find things that they can go, uh, and things they can do. So this is new signage that was installed last year. Uh, and last year, we also uh, had a pilot on uh, outdoor patios, and it was successful. And so the intent is to allow those again this year. Uh, we have a, a series of grant programs, community improvement programs. Uh, Last year, and in most years we've had about 14 or 15, but last year we had 14 applications with about $750,000 of private sector investment. And since the program was established, uh, the county's given $1.1 million in grants, but we've leveraged $5.2 million. So for every dollar we get, $5 is being invested, and this is in your downtown areas. And you can see from this slide that it's not just in one area, it's all over the county. So you can see that there's been a variety of applications and the amounts uh, by most of the major uh, uh, communities. And this is just an example of a small one that was done last year. So the left is the before and the uh, right is the after. And you can see that uh, you know, for the small amount of monies that we give out, the quality of the built environment is significantly improved. 
We also have a program that's targeted towards trying to support the hamlets and agriculture, and in particular, creating um, uh, opportunities for tourism supported uses, so things like bed and breakfast and hotels and things like that. And uh, over the course of this program, we've had 20 projects with uh, about $850,000 of investment. And these are a couple of, of projects that were dealt with last year. One is the Welcome Centre at Ruthven, the new Welcome Centre at Ruthven, and the other is a, um, a butcher shop in, in Jarvis. Uh, Council does support its downtown organization and its chambers uh, by providing annual grants and we also have a small environmental program where oh, I think uh, $25,000 a year uh, to uh, assist with people with tree planting, fencing off uh, water courses from livestock, those sorts of things. Uh, in general you can see that uh, in terms of the activity levels uh, the amount of outreach and the amount of development uh, uh, inquiries is actually very positive. You can see that's trending upwards, as has the number of people who are reaching out to the county through its uh, marketing services, uh, using the websites. I already talked about the program, so that just gives you a sense of sort of how much per year. Uh, the Community uh, Development and Partnerships Division uh, provides recreation programming as well as partnership activities. Uh, in general, there are about 80,000 people use that service a year, um, and you can see that uh, a significant number of people use the public swims and the public skates, uh, as well as the, uh, the services that are provided during March break and, and family day. To give you a sense of the trends, you can see that uh, the number of people who are using the summer day camp program is, is roughly triple what it started off in 2010. Uh, the number of people who are using the aquatic program, is, it's basically been consistent, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it shows you fairly dramatic change, the number of people who are, are using that service. And if you look at the free programs, you can see the last couple of years, uh, it, it peaked and it dropped off, but it's still significantly higher than when we started. Uh, we offer cultural programs, there's three museums, roughly 17,000 people use them on an annual basis. And uh, one of the key things that we try to do is we try to work with community groups, and you'll see something later today. But uh, when we started the program, there were roughly about 100 partnerships a year, and that same person is dealing with uh, over three times that amount. So it's, a, it's very busy, and certainly a lot has been achieved in that regard. Uh, you can see that we also have a program, a grant program, uh, that to support community groups with doing improvements to uh, public lands. And you can see over the course of the years that, you know, it varies by year, but the program in general has resulted in roughly, uh, for every dollar uh, that we put in, community groups are putting two, a little more than two dollars in. And that gives you a sense of some of the things that were done last year. So we had the splash pad open. We had the rehabilitation of the, um, I guess it was a fountain at one point in time in Dunville, as well as the, uh, the track, uh, paving of the track and the lighting in Jarvis. Uh, annually, we give uh, grants to downtown organizations and, and others to uh, do the beautification. So this is the flowers and the, uh, the improvements, uh, the, the, the Christmas lights and things like that. And over the, since that program has been in place since 2005, and you can see that yeah, about roughly $2.7 million, of which 70% of that is put in by the community groups. So by a little bit of money, we're able to support, I think, a lot of things that make the community a much better place. Um, we also support events. Uh, last year we had 89 events on our property. This is trending up, which is, pos which is really positive. And we support financially 14 um, major festivals, the intent being to try to grow the attendance and have people come see the county, spend their money, and uh, uh, learn about us. We also support field management groups, and council will be reminded that we had a re report a couple meetings ago where we uh, uh, revamped that program. <clears throat> we also have 17 community halls, just about 95,000 people use those annually. It's a very quiet program, but very impactful because it's throughout the county. And what the county does is we don't provide operating grants, but we do provide capital support in terms of fixing the building. And this county's invested nearly $3 million in those facilities over the course of the last few years. 
Uh, trails, you will recall that uh, uh, you know, trails is a uh, important component of connecting our communities and creating vibrancy. And last year, you'll see that, um, I wonder if that works. This trail here and that trail there were built. And so you can see through this graphic, the intent is to try to create a major trail system that will link our communities over time. And those are just some pictures of some of the, the openings and things that happened last year. And so you can see, I talked a little bit about this, but you can see the, uh, the number of summer camp. So in 2013, there were 1,000 people. We're now at 20, almost 2,300, and last year we added another camp because of the growth in Caledonia. But I think the most important thing is if you look at the capacity rate, and that's, that's the rate of... Um, that's a measurement of efficiency. So that what it means is those camps are almost full all the time. And that's really important. And so by implementing some efficiency measures and in terms of ensuring that we're not um, having full staff, if the camp's not full, we're actually delivering the service more efficiently. And you'll see uh, something similar in terms of the pools. So you'll see the increase from 74% to 87%. So while the number of people maybe is not increasing, the, uh, the, um, the ratio of staff to, uh, to the capacity is getting more efficient, which is positive. And you can see that the number of events has increased from 68 to 89 over the last five years, which I think is a very positive thing. And that's all I have to say in terms of the department. Sure. Uh, <coughs> through the mayor, uh, great presentation, Craig. Um, I know coming up to the summer, especially being a tourist community, uh, county, um, there tends to be a little more bylaw complaints and concerns. Are we currently at full complement as far as our bylaws officers? Um, well, we were until this morning. Uh, we've, oh. <laughs> we've had one bylaw officer accept another job in another location, but we've been at full complement for a while and we'll move towards expediting that, that higher process. The other thing too that, is, that we've done is um, uh, over the course of the last couple of years is we've worked with the, uh, the union and we've implemented uh, Saturday enforcement, yeah. which has helped. Yeah, I think that because that has been a concern of the, of the public that right. we weren't available maybe when the public was there and tourism. So that's worked quite well as you're saying. Yeah, I, I think it's been a success. Okay, excellent. How's Corbett? Yes, if I may, Your Worship, several questions and comments. First off, I, I have to start, and I know uh, I've got the Dunville Horticultural Society members here, and I, I have to give credit and appreciation what they do with the beautification grant in our community, and I perhaps believe it's done in every, every community. Again, publicly, thank you for doing that. Uh, questions I have, the volunteer hours in her her heritage and culture, is it an indication that we're having a number of volunteers back off or getting volunteers? I know we have a great number of volunteers in our community. Uh, yeah. What are you seeing? Um, I think what we're seeing is, is, first of all, I think the fact that we've got the equivalent of roughly two, two full-time equivalents of volunteers in that service is great. Uh, I think generally municipalities are, are having trouble sustaining the volunteer levels that we've historically had. Part of that is um, the people who do volunteering are getting older. Uh, I think part of it is the, the world has changed and there's a lot more uh, risk management and other things that, that have to go into it. And I think part of it is, is, is that the, a lot of families are really busy and so finding people to um, to step up and do that is becoming more challenging. Having said that, um, this particular county uh, is heads and tails above a lot of other places in terms of the number of people who, who add value to it through volunteering and through fundraising and everything. Thank you. I've got a number, Your Worship, if you don't mind. Yep. All right, ice rental usage percentage, I don't see much of a difference. Uh, have we had time to reflect upon a reduction in our rates? Um, we have not had time to, to, to fully vet that because that was done late last or middle of last year. So we need to go through another season, I think, to tr truly understand that. 
And why do you feel we're getting uh, the, the greater number of uh, bylaw complaints this year over other years? Well, uh, this year I think, or the last year was sort of, what we saw was a trend up, say, over the last five years. And the year before last was just out of the world. I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, but um, this year was, was consistent at the higher level. I think there's a couple of things. And I've asked staff, and, and uh, I think there's sort of two things. One is, is I think people are more aware, uh, and I think that when they see enforcement happening, they have a sense that if I make a complaint, something's going to happen. And so to some degree, when you start dealing with the issue, then other people want the same issue addressed, which is good. And, and so I think it's more of awareness and I think it's more of um, uh, dealing with it. I also think the different hours of operation have helped a little bit in the sense of being able to deal with some of the issues on the weekend. Thank you. Uh, I see, note that there is an increase in the number of development inquiries. What's that all about? Well, typically what we do, because I think it's really important. I mean, you see all the planners here, uh, you know, presenting an application, but not every, applica not every time somebody comes to the counter with an idea, it turns into an application. And so by measuring the number of contacts we have with people thinking, okay, I'd like to th pursue this or I'd like to look into this, it gives us a sense of the level of interest people have in investing. It also lets us measure how much time we're spending on those front counter activities. And what it's saying is, compared to say five years ago, the number of people that are interested in making investment by virtue of making inquiries is increased. And, and, and it's also taking more staff time to deal with that. Thank you. And the last question has to deal with major festival grants. And I'm talking in the order of $10,000. Uh, do we re require any uh, financial reporting by those people to get the funding? And if not, why not? Uh, the answer is yes, we do. <clears throat> and you can't get your funding unless you've reported. Is it an audited statement or just a statement? Oh, I don't know the details. Um, I don't know. Is it audited? It's just a statement. So that's acceptable for our staff for getting the $10,000? When we set up the program, we're always trying to balance off what's necessary versus trying to mitigate all risk. And we, we developed this program with, um, with our finance group and with our risk management group. And this is a, it's acceptable for our purposes, given the quantums we're talking about. And how do we look at that financial report with a fine tooth comb or just accept it as presented? No, staff go through it. Every year as, as groups apply, they go through the, the, the and, and make sure that, uh, first of all, the money uh, was spent where it was supposed to be spent. And uh, as they make applications, they have to make applications every year. And uh, so staff do go through it and make sure that it's all on the up and up. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a comment, Craig. Um, <clears throat> I was looking at your tourism experience focuses connecting on an emotional level, storytelling, and local people. Sense of place unique to Haldeman. Uh, last night I sat on my first uh, Heritage Committee uh, <laughs> meeting last night, and more and more people are visiting our area to visit the heritage spots. Um, I'd like to see maybe an increase for our heritage budget um, in the future. Uh, it seems to be another reason why people are coming to Haldeman and may stay longer and visit more different different places throughout the county as well. I think, I, I think that's a good comment. I think one of the things people are generally looking for are, when they travel and do tourism is authenticity. And part of that is heritage, part of that. And it's, it's also trying to say, how can the heritage group work with the economic <clears throat> development group? So for example, a couple of years ago, they had um, heritage dinners as part of uh, an economic development program where people could come and experience what it was like to live and eat like a pioneer, right? And marketing that to people like from Hamilton and other places where it's an easy drive. And by virtue of having people come in, then they can experience <clears throat> the county and they can learn more and hopefully spend some money. Thank you. Um, yeah, Craig, I'm looking at uh, the pool, use of the pool in 
2017 to 18, our residential use has virtually stayed the same both years. Um, uh, Dunville, the non-resident use went down a little bit. Hagersville actually went up, but Calumny is down significantly, um, which to me is a good thing because the capacity situation that we had um, from non-residents um, obviously got deterred going into 18. Or is there still a move? Have you studied that? Or are we going to stay with a recommendation to stay as non-residents will pay to use? Right. So just uh, for everyone's sake, uh, Council a couple of years ago did introduce a non-residence fee to uh, ensure that the free programming of the pool or the free use of the pool was uh, <coughs> primarily um, oriented towards uh, the residents who fund it through their taxes. Um, and last year, uh, we did ma monitor it. Um, the amount of money we took in more than covered the cost of operating that program. The overall use of the, of the pool dropped, but again, I think it's uh, still significantly higher. We, we are intending to keep this on an ongoing basis, and it's been something that um, I think uh, has, has achieved its objectives, and it was done fairly, and, and uh, uh, we haven't had a lot of uh, issues with it. Good. Nice. Okay. Well, as always, it's refreshing, Craig, to have that presentation because uh, when we are out beating on the streets and doors and we hear about all the things that uh, could be done or improved upon, you start to actually reflect on what's actually happening out there. And there's quite a bit uh, going on in the county. And uh, Thank you very much. I, th I think it's really useful because you see things in drips and drabs. And I think once you see them together, it gives you a yeah. sense of just how much your staff yeah, is as, as you know as we go through that presentation you look back and you know it's kind of that that sort of tipping point was about 2009 10 when we started to really re beef up these these programs and it's really amazing to see the results so so sure. thanks for that presentation and all right and i believe jason's doing his next oh do we have to <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no flood waters oh. you want to do this one though yeah we want to prove this both at the end that's fine okay you can do them both well that We'll let Jay go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think just one thing with Craig's presentation, keeping the numbers and measuring is yeah. being a big diff, like a big, a lot of, and all staff through uh, Craig's department, all departments, really measuring outcomes and sort of the inputs going into it, but really tracking it. So now we've got a rich history based on year after year of being able to look at it. So you can, it's very defensible. And it's also something you can celebrate and, and, and make adjustments if you see downturns or not, but it's been good. Been through. Jason, two hours? Three. Three. <laughs> so through the mayor, I, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to present Emergency <laughs> Services 2018 annual report. Um, it was a busy, busy year for us in 2018 so again thank you for the opportunity and I will present a lot quicker than last year and uh, at a higher level so we can get through it quickly and you guys can have your rest of your council meeting and enjoy a lunch so um, just distance yourself from Mark's presentation so <laughs> So for fire services, we'll, I'll present as I did last year in regards to, although we are emergency services and our umbrella, umbrella covers fire service, paramedic services, as well as emergency management, we'll break it down to um, the fire services and the paramedic services. So fire services first, this is our organizational chart. Um, obviously, um, it's there in front of you for review. So the... So for 2018, some of our highlights for um, the fire department was we purchased land for the new Caledonia share facility for fire and paramedic. We also completed a review in regards to our standard operating guidelines. We do that on a regular basis, introducing new SOGs, which are the fire standard operating guidelines. However, a complete overview of the um, operating guidelines hadn't been completed since 2001 so we reviewed every SOG and revised it so it was up to date with the most recent tactics and operations for the fire service. We achieved compliance with Emergency Management Ontario. We completed a robust smoke and carbon monoxide 
alarm program with the firefighters visiting many homes throughout the county. We were able to visit approximately 769 homes this year. Um, we inspected 542 homes. We did notice this year that we had a lot more refus refusals in regards to the residents allowing us to enter their homes to inspect. Um, a lot of that was due to um, time of day so we with fire prevention have determined and reworked our smoke and carbon monoxide program for this year to be able to get into more residents and inspect. Um, we're working towards the firefighter certifications regarding NFPA level one and two. And of course our fire prevention bureau is always busy with their mandatory inspections, evacuations and inspections of care facilities. So if you look at our total incidents for 2018, we were up from last from 2017 um, we responded to approximately 995 calls the reason for the increase we've noticed through our our data was due to an increase in MV motor vehicle collisions as well as an increase in medical calls and specifically drug overdose calls so those calls come in as usually unconscious or vital signs absent calls which is an automatic tier for the fire department so that's why the medical calls have gone up as well as the mvcs because um, there is specific things the fire department has to do at car accidents for example spill containment extrication that sort of thing so as those calls go up obviously um, our call volume goes up as well and with the MVCs, there's just more people traveling through the community nowadays, which obviously increases the amount of motor vehicle collisions. So this breaks down actually the percentage of the calls. And again, it shows um, what our highest percentage of responses are, motor vehicle accidents, remote alarms, and medical calls. This breaks it down per station. Dunville continues to be our busiest station, followed by Caledonia and then Hagersville. And the other stations obviously are listed there as well. Um, the dark blue is the station responses in regards to the individual station responses, and then the light blue is assists. So if Hagersville was to go into Caledonia to assist on a structure fire, it would fall under the light blue category that's in front of you there. Structure fires, so in 2018 it appears to be a higher number at 47. The reason why it's so high compared to the rest is because now we're reporting on agricultural fires. So in the past we didn't report on barn fires and agricultural structures because the province and the fire marshal we don't have to report that to them unless of course there's some um, illegal action behind it so regards to arson if there was an explosion or that sort of thing however we've never reported on the actual structure of the agriculture and we found that we should be including that in our report so it gives a more thorough and true example of what type of structure fires we're responding to this is our fire prevention bureau um, with their inspections what they um, respond to um, so it, it breaks it down in the chart there what, we're, we're, what they're responding to. Um, obviously there is mandatory inspections that they have to do yearly. For example, vulnerable care facilities, Grandview Lodge, any nursing home, that sort of thing. Um, there's also a set out inspection program that goes from one to five years, which includes schools, restaurants, daycares, et cetera, et cetera. They have other activities that they have to perform. Obviously, they have to look at applications for fire, fireworks. They also have to look at um, fire safety plans. So each year, the fire safety plans for vulnerable occupancies, restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, have to be reviewed and signed off by the Fire Prevention Bureau as well as the chief fire official to ensure that um, the building's safe, it's meeting fire code, and that they actually have proper evacuations and safety plans if there was a fire in the building. So our objectives for 2019, we're gonna continue with a proactive fire safety and education program. We're gonna continue with a robust training program, keeping in mind the NFPA level one and level two. We're going to complete a risk assessment. We haven't completed a risk assessment since 2013, so we're gonna update that. As well, it's a mandatory compliance now from the fire marshal, so we'll be completing that this year. We have to complete our tanker shuttle accreditation recertification, which is done every five years, which is 
we have to be able to prove we can keep a constant flow of water through it through tankers rurally to be able to um, keep the insurance rates low for residential properties and it, we're going to begin to plan the Caledonia fire and paramedic station as well as um, we have to mandatorily start uh, reporting response times to the uh, fire marshal so that's the report for fire so paramedic services organizational chart um, again you can see it it's in front of you there so paramedic services are achievements for 2018. So we replaced the remainder of our cardiac monitors with the most advanced cardiac monitor that's out there. Um, it's a Zoll monitor and paramedics are pleased with it for a number of reasons. A, the technology that comes with it, as well as the actual weight of the cardiac monitor. It's a lot lighter than our previous ones. So um, again, it benefits us in the long run because we're not getting injuries for the amount of equipment that they have to carry. We also completed the replacement of the power stretchers as well as um, we started installing on new ambulances the power load systems, which is a new system that uh, more or less the paramedics can offload and load a stretcher with one arm where before it would take quite a bit of strength and um, physical work to get the patient in the back of the ambulance. So this will reduce WSIB, shoulder, back injuries, that sort of thing. Again, part of the purchase of the Caledonia Fire and EMS base, and then we had uh, two paramedic recruitments. Um, altogether, we had 800 paramedics apply to Haldeman County for employment for a total of nine positions. So we are, um, I can say, a very, um, achievable at getting good paramedics as well as we're one of the counties that's known for the commitment to the the residents as well as um, commitment to staff and uh, a lot of paramedics want to work in Haldeman County so we're very pleased with that so as far as calls go again you'll notice a trend in the increase of emergency calls our code four calls, which is our life threatening calls, lights and siren calls, again, have gone up as well as our code three, which is an urgent call. It's not a lights and siren call. However, it is an urgent call and we are required to be to those calls within a certain amount of time, which is a standard through the province. Our code one and two calls. So these are our deferrable calls, which are non-emergency calls. And the, the goal for this is to decrease them so we're available for the emergency calls. And as you can see, the tr it does trend to decrease with uh, code two being a scheduled transfer. So an appointment at a hospital in the city, we would take someone for an x-ray, um, check their fracture, that sort of thing. We've worked with the hospitals as well as transfer services because we can't offer a good service in that. Um, type of service because we want to be available for the emergencies, not the low priority calls. There's transfer services that could do that. So um, as you can see, there was quite the drop last year, as well as with code ones, which is a deferrable call, which can be anything from a return home from the hospital or simple fractured finger. Somebody calls the ambulance, we go and pick them up because we are obligated. If you phone 911, the ambulance has to respond to your residents. Our standbys. They go up every year. Again, our standbys are when we have to cover off other areas within the county when those vehicles respond to calls. However, we also are required, because ambulance is a seamless service in the province of Ontario, to do standbys covering off other municipalities. What we did last year in 2017, I'll use Brantford for example. We used to do a standby location halfway between Brantford and Caledonia. What we did is we move the Caledonia ambulance so it stays in Caledonia when we're on standby for Brantford, which allows us to cover our community, which is okay with the Ministry of Health because we're still offering a service to Brantford at that time. Our priority is servicing Haldeman County residents, so that's why those ambulances stay in Haldeman County. So the increase of call volume over the last five years, um, again, it's increased the most, again, this year in 2018 to 10,000 339 calls so as you can see there's been quite the increase in emergency calls over the last five years and again this is just a chart that breaks down the the percentage of the calls this is our 90th percentile 
So what it means is Haldeman County were able to respond 90% of the time to a code four within 16 minutes and 55 seconds or less. So our objectives for 2019, we're retrofitting two of our 2017 ambulances with the power load system, as well with the ordering of a new ambulance for 2019. All our frontline ambulances will be equipped with this new power load system with the power stretchers, which will definitely help in reducing any back or shoulder injuries. We're restructuring our paramedic response bags to make them more the ability for the paramedics to respond to calls quicker and have the proper equipment in the bag. Some of our bags at this point have some equipment in them that we don't normally use on a day-to-day -day basis, so we're reorganizing them to make them more um, achievable for the paramedics to, to do their calls. We're gonna work with the fire department to design the, the Caledonia Fire and Paramedic Station, achieve our response time standards, and we're, rev we're currently reviewing our deployment plan to ensure that uh, we have the proper resources in the county and uh, if we need more, we'll be preparing a report to bring to council. And that is it. I'll go Councillor Corbett first this time. Thank you very much and uh, I thank the uh, two departments that were represented here with regard to the services that they provide. We hear from the public that they get nothing for their money community services and development and certainly emergency services were well served by both departments and thank you very much for your presentation. And I should pass on to again the comments from Dwight Boyd from the Grand River Conservation uh, Authority and it's a pleasure to work with you guys. You know what you're doing when it comes to an emergency. So again, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sheridan. Um, through the mayor, Jason, nice presentation. Um, I'll echo Councillor Corbett. The standbys, just to be clear, are those calls that we do, or are, they, are there just potential calls that, where they've gone up? And then part two of that question is, if our standbys are going up, are the other municipalities, i.e. Niagara, or who else, Norfolk on the other side, are their standbys going up for us or are just ours going up for the other municipalities? So through the chair, the, under the Ministry of Health uh, response time standard, a standby is an actual emergency call through, and what, what happens in those, or in those type of situations is the ambulance will go either, in Haldeman um, proper will go sit in another station as if, so for example, if Caledonia goes out on a call, the Cuga ambulance goes to Caledonia and sits in the station. If a call comes in, they're able to respond to it. In regards to other municipalities, yes, their standby numbers are going up as well. If we're not, if our ambulance resources are down and we cannot respond in our own area because we're out on other calls, then we have backup from other municipalities that do standbys for us as well. Okay, I just wanted to ensure that and to the public that we have coverage when we're doing these standbys. So yes. thanks for that. I got Councillor Metcalf and Councillor Lawrence. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Jason. A great presentation. Uh, are we ever in a situation, uh, I know Hamilton Wentworth, you hear on the news that they have had code zeros where they have no ambulances available. Are we ever in that situation out here in, in Haldeman? So through the chair, yes, we do experience code zero um, activity, usually a few times a week. However, with our deployment plan and the seamless service through the province, resources are moved through other municipalities to cover off, as well as we use our fire department to um, respond with our tiered response program. So there is at least a first responder on scene. We also use uh, our, our deputy chiefs in first response vehicles to respond to calls as well as myself being a paramedic, I respond to emergency calls as well in the county. Um, fantastic, Jason, the service that you guys provide to us. I can speak personally on that. Um, kind of piggybacking on to Councillor Metcalf, uh, the service you guys provide is amazing and the code zeros that sometimes you experience. If you could, for the public especially, because I get asked this, how close are, is the need for another full-time ambulance and attendance in the county? If you could. So through the chair, um, we're actually reviewing the data right now to determine if uh, another ambulance is required to provide <laughs> service for the community. Um, we definitely have noticed over the years that there is an increase in call volume. Um, we're right now, 
to be honest, struggling to meet our, our needs, mostly during the evening and overnight hours. Um, however, we have deployment plans to move ambulances to cover off so we are able to respond within our response time standards. And like I said, when we do complete the review of the data, there will be a report coming to Council to provide that information. Councillor Patterson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Jason, just a, a quick question on response time. Say for communities like Selkirk or Jarvis that your typically is not an ambulance on site. If it's like a serious medical, what's a typical fire department's response time to get to a heart attack, let's say? So in regards to, I'll use, um, I'll speak to ambulance first, then the fire department. So specific to Jarvis and Selkirk area, Jarvis, the average response time for an ambulance is between six and eight minutes, and it responds out of the Hagersville station. If the Hagersville ambulance is not in station, then obviously we move a standby in. However, if we're um, overwhelmed with calls, then Norfolk would come in and do a standby for us. And again, it would be a six to eight minute response time. In regards to the fire department, um, the fire department, from the moment they get the page till the firefighters respond to the hall, and get on the trucks, the average time is, again, between six to eight minutes. Add travel time to that, it's probably 10 minutes by the time the fire department gets to those patients. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jason, for again, a good Thanks. presentation. Um, I need a mover and a seconder that report CDS 0119 Community and Development Services 18 annual report be received. Councilor Patterson. Councillor Lawrence, all in favor? That is carried unanimously. And a mover and a seconder that report EMS 0119 Emergency Services 18 annual report be received. Councillor Shurton, Councillor Midcalf, all in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Okay, and uh, we're just going to. Uh, uh, before we break for lunch, we're going to go to report uh, CDP 0219 Community Partnership Program Dunville Thompson Creek Park Rehabilitation Project updates, page 170 uh, in the agenda. And we're doing that because uh, members of the public are here. And rather than make them sit and wait for another hour and a half to get there, or actually longer, we like to let them get on with their day. So, um, so. Just pull this up for myself. <clears throat> the recommendations uh, are on page 170. I don't know if there's any questions or comments regarding the report. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but uh, if there's anything to staff, not. Uh, I need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Corbett, seconded Councillor Lawrence. All in favor? Or Councillor Sheridan? Well, yeah, no, I was just going to speak a little bit for the people that are in the gallery. Um, this is a great project that they're trying to initiate, and it's going to tie in, like, there's basically uh, four or five schools within this area, so with the signage and things planned, it's going to be a great educational thing, and they're hoping it might even, it, down the road, it might even uh, be as good or even better than what's at Taquanya. So kudos to this uh, initiative, and I'll be looking forward to this project being completed. To you, Mr. Mayor. Just a thanks to the group and also thanks to uh, to staff Katrina Sheila for just being able to this was not a if this was a cumbersome one having to work through another municipality and through these these things but um, as these things sometimes take a while to get to fruition but the, at the end of the day it's a great news uh, project a uh, great group uh, community group doing it and so it's uh, it's just another example of a community uh, uh, partnership program moving forward that uh, staff are, are, are super proud of well if deb and deb are on it and katrina's behind it then it's Damn probably a good there. thing and ray oh. and ray yeah, yeah. So. all good uh so i those ticks out there though <laughs> <laughs> so i had a mover and a seconder did i get one yep. yeah yeah so all in favor <coughs> that's carried unanimously okay well, we do have a little bit of time, so we might as well knock a couple of items off. Back to the motions. Motions of consent. Okay. So just a comment. 
You've got so, a comment? Yeah, so item four under motions for consent, uh, the engineering report 01-2019 for accessible parking. Um, staff have withdrawn that report to allow for time to uh, review the plans with the accessibility committee. So that'll come back at a future meeting. Okay, so he's got three, okay. Okay, so let's get the motions on the floor. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Delamani, Sir Corbett. Questions or comments with the three items? No, we're all good. Seeing none. I got a couple. Uh, of Councillor Lawrence. Um, just so you're aware, we got a couple things here that I brought up. The the one on King William Street in Caledonia. Uh, currently, the stop signs service going north south on uh, that property, whereas King Williams is actually an east west corridor. And why we've asked for the realignment of that through the residents and myself is that they're using that, they're getting off of McClung, and then they're speeding right over going east on to bypass maybe some traffic sitting at the stop sign at McClung. Um, and so it's becoming a throughway, and in that little community, the old town of Seneca there's actually been kids that have been hit over the past number of years so we're just actually turn stop signs they're there we're actually turning them so they're going to stop the traffic going east west kind of break it up so that's on that and uh, then if I could sp then with regard to Kathan Street West we're putting a parking restriction there with time so that in the time period of uh, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. in the day there will be no parking there so that it it's kind of causing, with parking there, it's causing a bottleneck actually to further go up uh, west onto Kaysna Street. So we're restricting the parking there to hopefully to help alleviate some, um, some traffic congestion. So if anybody has any questions on that, I can answer that or Good. otherwise that's where that is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. That was my two there, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Patterson. Yeah, thank you. Through the chair, I'm, I'm not going to object to it. I'm just a little leery about um, the one as far as the uh, two-way parking on Alma Street in Hagersville. I know the Legion definitely needs additional parking. I'm a member of the Hagersville Legion, so I'm all in favor of it. I'm just really leery, and I'm not going to question staff's expertise because they say it, it meets the warrants, it's wide enough. But if you park a car on the uh, over on the legion and there's a car parked across the way is really tight for two cars to to go by so just putting people on notice it's a great idea it helps out the legion but we might be dealing with missing mirrors on cars as they pass each other <laughs> sure. that's depending on how long you stay in the legion though <laughs> i'm talking <laughs> people driving by not the people leaving <laughs> you're say you're not in the parking lot watching are you <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> That's carried unanimously. Uh, da -da -da -da. Eh, I guess we probably should Point just. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll break for lunch, <laughs> reconvene yeah. at one. Peter's here. No, I know, but what's.